Welcome to City of Glendale Transportation and Parking Commission regular meeting, meeting Monday, February 27, 2017. Welcome, everyone. Uh, can we have item number one, please? Item one is roll call. Commissioner Gonzalez? Here. Commissioner Yakubian? Here. Commissioner Sahakian? Here. Commissioner Bajrasov? Here. Chairperson Kirchian? Here. Uh, let's go for flag salute. Item number two. Item two is posting of the agenda. The agenda for the Monday, February 27, 2017 regular meeting of the Glendale Transportation and Parking Commission was posted by Friday, February 24th, 2017 by 5 p.m. on the bulletin board outside of City Hall. Item number three, approval of minutes. The approval of the October 24, 2016 regular meeting. We take a roll call. Any motion? I'm, I'll move it. Second. Second. That. Commissioner Gonzalez. Yes. Commissioner Kubian. Yes. Commissioner Sahakian. Yes. Commissioner Batrasov. Yes. Chairperson Kirkchan. Yes. Item number four: oral communication. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The commission may question the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. I have no speaker cards. Since we have no cards, no speakers, can we move on to item number five, please? Item five is information only. A presentation on a reverse angle parking presented by Wayne Coe. Mr. Coe? Yeah, right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, um, Chairperson Kirkian, uh, members of the Commission. Um, at the request of Commissioner Bartusov, we have prepared this informational presentation re regarding reverse angle parking. Um, so we're going to talk about what is reverse angle parking, the um, advantages and disadvantages of reverse angle parking. I'm also going to present a list of cities that are currently using a reverse angle parking. And then finally, uh, we're going to present two video clips uh, basically documenting a city's experience about reverse angle parking. So um, before we go with reverse angle parking, um, I'm showing this is a conventional angle parking. Uh, this is just like any spaces on Brand Boulevard or Montrose Avenue. Uh, drivers basically pull straight into the space. Um, the disadvantage of that, of course, is when they leave, they would have to back into oncoming traffic. So what is reverse angle parking? Now, reverse angle parking basically is to switching the angle to the other direction. It requires a driver to pass a vacant space um, and then signal and then back into the space. It takes a little bit skills, a little practice to do that, uh, but it's not supposed to be as difficult as uh, parallel parking. So what are the advantages of reverse angle parking? First of all, um, if we are converting parallel parking to angle parking, that means you are gaining the number of spaces because for the same curb distance, uh, you will, of course, have a lot more uh, spaces you can put in for angle parking. The disadvantage of that will be um, losing one travel lane. Most cities, when they convert uh, parallel parking to angle parking, they will take out the air, uh, parallel parking lane as well as one travel lane adjacent to it to make space for the angle parking. Um, the second advantage, uh, advantage of, of this is it's safer, uh, offer greater visibility for drivers uh, because driver is going to be pulled out of the space, so that's why their uh, field of view is much better. They can see uh, approaching vehicles as well as uh, bicyclists, um, so uh, visibility is a lot better. And it's also more convenient and safer to load and unload uh, from their trunk. Uh, because it's right next adjacent to the sidewalk. And doors open off uh, the streets. In other words, when you open the door, they guide pedestrian and children to the curb instead of out in, onto moving traffic. 
and it's safe of bicycles because um, bicycles will not be doored by um, parked cars. And finally, the advantage, and some residents actually said that they like reverse angle parking because the headlight do not shine into their homes uh, when they back into the space. Now, the disadvantage of reverse angle parking now, um, it will not increase the number of parking spaces if you're converting to, uh, from conventional angle parking to um, reverse angle parking. As a matter of fact, you may even lose some spaces because uh, right now the standard width of a um, conventional uh, angle parking is eight foot six, eight feet six. And um, a lot of recommendation is to have a wider space. Some, some goes as far as uh, nine up to 10 feet for reverse angle parking so it's easier to back into the space. So uh, because of that, um, we may actually lose some parking spaces. And the other one is it may con uh, create confusion for driver actually, behind. Actually, what will be the length of the conventional parking versus uh, angle parking, whether it's reverse or otherwise? Uh, it's probably the same. It will be the same. It makes a little bit difference on where you put the wheel stop, and I'm going to cover that issue yeah. later on too, but um, it's, the width is, is more or less the same. But in this case, actually, uh, we'll, we may create some confusion because the driver has to pass the vacant space and back into uh, that space. So if you have bumper to bumper traffic, if you have a street that is very congested, then it makes it rather difficult for the driver behind to back up uh, to allow this, uh, this vehicle to get, enter the space. And uh, also, if the driver behind this vehicle is trying to, also looking for a space, then they may not let him uh, back up. And then um, the rear view vehicle overhang may encroach further into the sidewalk. And this actually uh, goes back to the issue that uh, um, Chairperson Kirchin raised. Uh, it depends on the type of vehicle. Um, usually the front hang, um, the overhang are pretty much uniform from vehicle to vehicle, to vehicle. but depends on the type of vehicle, the rear overhang is different, especially when you have a pickup truck with a long bed. Um, something like that could actually encroach into the sidewalk. So the placement of the wheel stop is very critical now in this case. Um, in, in order to account for a uh, vehicle with a long overhang, rear overhang, we may have to have a longer space because the wheel stop may have to pull further out. And um, of course, the vehicle exhaust pipe will be facing the sidewalk. So when you have um, sidewalk dining or some sort of uh, bus shelter of a bus bench, that could create some type of problem. And um, the other thing is driver from opposite direction may illegally park in a store head in. Um, so if you find a space, if it's really difficult to find a parking space, and there's a parking space across the street on the other side, uh, they may just pull in. Uh, this is, which is really dangerous, but guess when they pull out, they will be facing oncoming traffic. And uh, so that's why it is recommended that something, when we reverse parking, probably the best design would have some sort of a raised median in the middle to prevent that from happening. And lastly is the new parking style may intimidate some drivers. As you can see, um, this picture, some people will head in, some of them will back in. Uh, it will create some confusion, uh, probably a learning curve there. Um, a lot of cities say you have to have very extensive outreach and education program in order to, for the drivers to understand what to do. And some even uh, recommend in the morning, early in the morning, just park one city vehicle there as a sample so that people will see how it's supposed to be, how it's supposed to be parked and so they can follow. Can you, can you please go back to the previous visual? Previous visual, yes. Let me see, this one. I know that some are parked um, reverse angle and some are not. Is it, should reverse angle parking be allowed? Is uh, it then exclusively reverse angle or can it be both? No, actually it should be exclusively reverse. Okay, uh, otherwise it would be really uh, confusing. Actually this is just to show the confusion okay. that people may have. Thank you. Yeah. And then um, this is a list of cities that currently uh, use reverse angle parking. This is not a complete list. Um, there are other cities as well, but uh, this is what we have uh, gathered so far. And as you can see, um, the, state, the state of Washington actually has a number of cities uh, that has reverse angle parking, a couple of cities of California as well. And uh, I'm going to have a video clip now. This is for the city of Austin, basically. There are two clips. The first one uh, basically highlights the advantage of uh, reverse angle parking. And I'll try to play this. Media right now. 
Does this look familiar? Backing into traffic on a busy road is something drivers face every day. Well, Austin is working to make parking safer. Here's how it works. Back in angle parking is one step easier than parallel parking. Simply signal the traffic behind, pull past the spaces as you would with parallel parking, and back in. Loading packages is safer here on the sidewalk. And open doors block you from busy streets. And the best part, when you're ready to leave, it's easy to see oncoming traffic, including bicyclists. In Austin, bicycles are a popular way to get around. Bicycle lanes around town help protect cyclists from the flow of traffic. But drivers backing out of spaces blindly creates potential for a collision. Back in angle parking helps remove this danger and has proven effective not only in the cities across the U.S., but right here in Austin. For over a year, drivers and cyclists on Dean Keaton Street have safely shared the road. And new to 6th Street business, owners Jim of Swedish Hill and Brad Fortney of Fortney's Antique say they have seen the benefits too. I love the fact that I can now load people's cars from the safety of the sidewalk. We don't have to worry about major amount of traffic. I like that when they're finished and ready to leave, that they can comfortably depart whenever the traffic is clear. They have a full view of, of the road and so much safer. I've been here back in Austin 17 years. I never parked on 6th Street when it was head-end parking. I park out there all the time now. It's, it's, it's changed, it's different. It was a little hard at first and, and now I'm used to it and most of our customers have gotten used to it and really like it. So Austin, as you encounter back in angle parking around town, remember, it's easier than parallel parking, and more importantly, safer for everyone who shares our roads. And now this is, is an, another video clip actually from the same city, but is the point of view of the business owners. The new back-end angle parking spaces along West 6th Street downtown have opened up, but business owners and customers who are now forced to use those spots are very unhappy. And the city changed those spaces along West 6th between Lamar and Blanco to help integrate a continuous bike lane for 6th Street and make it safer for motorists pulling out of those spaces. Jared Wise joins us live there along 6th Street to explain how the driver confusion now has led to some extreme frustration. Jared? Our customers are angry. Um, people have come in here and just ranted and raved about how difficult it is now to park. For 18 years, Deborah Labonte and her husband have been running this jewelry store along West 6th Street. But Positive Images is getting a lot of negative attention, all because of the new parking out front. And I've seen a lot of people just drive off. They just, they don't want to deal with it. In front of her store, convenience is replaced with confusion as drivers try to figure out the new routine. That makes no sense. I almost got rear-ended coming in this morning. I just think it's a lousy idea. People have to stop traffic and then back up. And what's happening is people are honking behind you because they're in a hurry. This is 6th Street. It's a really busy street. Inside Wiggy's liquor store, owner Tim Kutach watches out his window as one by one, drivers pass his business. It's not the kind of street that, that this type of uh, parking works on, in my opinion. And it, it, it will, would work for long-term parking, yes. But if, for an in-and-out kind of thing, it's not. The city of Austin is doing what they can. They've hired flaggers to help guide drivers into their spots and are handing out flyers with details on how to use the spaces. There's some contact information on the back, okay. too. Very good. Okay. I will read it. Thank right. you. And while some drivers realize change can be difficult... you got to try it out. you got to feel it out and see if people catch on. Business owners here hope people will get used to it before it forces them out of business. We're just here trying to make a living, and the city, you know, is making it very difficult for us to do that. Now, there's already parking on Dean Keaton that has back-end angle parking. That's on the UT campus. That's been in place for a little while. But 
the city of Austin's also considering the idea of putting that parking onto South Congress as well, depending on the, how transition period happens here as well. Now, pull, backing up into the parking place is a tough spot, but we're going to try to pull out into the space, which is supposed to be the easiest part of the whole park. Reporting live in West, uh, along West 6th Street, Jared Wise, KXN, Austin News. We'll try to do this. <laughs> And um, I'm ready to answer any questions you may have. Go ahead. Anyone? I don't have any questions. I have opinions. But uh, no, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Very informative. Just, just one observation. I will touch on this one. Uh, pulling in across a bicycle lane, uh, it's, it's much safer than backing into a bicycle lane because you have bicycles coming to you right now, they're in front of you, versus if you're gonna back into the lane, that's more of a, uh, a danger. Uh, and, and the time that you will occupy the bike lane is probably longer. Uh, and and uh, it's not as easy to back in. Uh, now, obviously the downside is when you're pulling out and there's traffic, uh, it's a, you're creating a dangerous situation. So mixed feelings about it. Right. And, and also, um, uh, the discussion is um, when you have all the spaces full and there's one vacant space, it's easier to back into it. But if you have a bunch of vacant space, right. it's really difficult. Um, to find the edge to back into it is, is challenging and takes some practice. And backing in straight uh, in the middle of two parallel lanes uh, is, is much more challenging than pulling into it. Uh, so it's going to create a situation where not everybody's parked straight in, uh, which is going to basically uh, drivers will have to pull back out, pull back in, and then to adjust that uh, the, the parking alignment. That's that is correct. Yes. Well, do we have this already in the city, or are we considering it in the city, or what's the what's the why are we being why are we discussing? I'm, it's um, very educational and helpful. But is it already happening? Um, C Commissioner Gonzalez, no, no. Right now, with the city do not do not have any reverse angle parking. All we have is just conventional angle parking. Um, we uh, the reason we we actually looking at different alternatives is because of the uh, bicycle master plan. We have locations where we need to implement the bicycle master plans, and we're trying to find what is the safest option to put the bicycle. Uh, the option could be putting the angle parking. Uh, and a bicycle between the angle parking and the curb, or maybe putting the um, bicycle lane behind the uh, angle parking but have reverse angle parking. So right now we're just exploring different options. If, if you're going to, I'm sorry I'm cutting in here, uh, Commissioner. If, if you're going to encourage bicyclists to ride, then I would give them a protected lane. So by, by locating the lane between parked vehicles and the, and the curbside, uh, it's... it's uh, uh, Safer, definitely safer. That is correct. That because is correct. Either way, I mean, if you're reverse angle parking or angle parking, you're still crossing the bicycle lane. Yes. Right. Yes. Would, would this be? Con I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Would, would this be considered where we already have uh, angle parking, or would this be considered where we have parallel parking? It depends. Um, when we have, if we have parallel parking, and we want to have reverse angle parking or any type of angle parking for that matter uh, most likely will require a lane reduction design uh, because we will be probably losing one travel lane. So is it considered safer for bicyclists? It seems to me that there's pros and cons on this one. Yes, yes. Actually, um, the, the general feeling in, in the industry is it is safer for, for bicycles when you, bicyclists when you pull out of the uh, angle space, yes. But not when you're pulling in. But not when you're pulling in. Yes. So, so that balances it out. As, as a bicyclist, I would say if somebody's backing into a parking spot, you can see them backing in. Um, as a bicyclist that rides on Brand Boulevard, it's, it would be far superior to have reverse angle parking than, ang than regular angled parking. And just since I'm speaking, the, the reason why I asked Wayne to 
come up with this presentation was precisely what he said, which is the bike plan uh, calls for bike lanes on Brand Boulevard north of Glen Oaks. And I know back when the bike plan was being discussed, uh, Brand south of Glen Oaks was considered a corridor study because of this issue about the angled parking. And um, there actually is enough width on the street to have a bike lane, but it's simply because of its safety of, uh, for the bicyclist. Uh, it can't be considered with the current configuration. So it can, as I understand, with reverse angle parking, and obviously it comes with the benefits. Um, I think the, the, having those, b both of those videos come from Austin is really interesting. I assume that the video that came uh, with the businesses up in arms was just as soon as it was implemented. And I imagine this was years ago. It looks like a pretty dated video. I'm really curious what those businesses feel like today or if the city has regrets about installing it or if they took it out completely. Um, that'd be really interesting to know. I mean, I saw the people in the vests, and I think of our uh, downtown ambassadors, people that could be educating people on how to park safely in these new proposed uh, parking spots. But. Um, we have a lot of angled parking in the city, and it's something that we can consider, particularly if we're thinking about pedestrian safety. It talked about the, the benefits to pedestrians. Um, and of course, as we promote more active transportation with walking, biking, definitely the bike lane, um, having one there would be much far more superior than not having one at all. Um, but definitely agree with you, protected bike lanes is is becoming the new standard. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have much of that in our bike plan, but I'm hoping in the future, and as we consider these new configurations, we can start to look at that. So, so did I understand that um, a uh, bike lane cannot go in in regular uh, diagonal parking that we have now, angle parking? I'll, I don't understand the logic of that. So, uh, I'm sorry, um, Commissioner Gonzalez, could you repeat that question again? I'm just wondering, I, I heard Alex comment about, and I am interpreting that it, there seems to be a, a requirement or a code requirement that a, um, a bike lane cannot go in where there is currently regular diagonal parking. It's actually a safety concern, because right now when somebody back out, they do not see the bicycle coming. So that's why the bike may, may hit the rear of the vehicle. Uh, whereas if you have reverse angle parking, the driver is actually in the front of it, of the vehicle, and you can see any bike poaching. So putting a bike lane in, uh, and your the thinking is that there's a, more of a safety concern. So where does a bicyclist go in that condition? Then that is the discussion we are. That's what we are scratching our heads right now. It could again, it could go between the curb and the angle parking. So basically, the bicycle will be totally protected. The cyclist will be totally protected with their own lane. Uh, between the curb and the angle parking. Uh, or if you have reverse angle parking, that will be actually outside of the angle parking, a bike lane outside of the angle parking. I'll add the other scenario that poses a problem for bicyclists is if a driver is heading this in the same direction as a bicyclist and they want to pull into a parking spot, they often are looking for a bicyclist and may just swerve into the, on, on, into the path of the bicyclist. I know a lawyer that lives in Ross Moyne and would ride his bike every day downtown. And in South Brand, near the dealerships, that's how he got hit. Uh, crashed on the ground, got a concussion. It was really bad, and he doesn't ride his bike anymore because mm -hmm. of that. So I have that in the back of my mind as a story, a personal story of a friend that I have. And um, this is just one of the ways that we can minimize the cost to pedestrians and bicyclists, whether it's death or injury. Well, I, I'd like to, well, first, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Bartrasov for bringing this up. This was very educational. Um, it was really good to see what the options are. Um, you know, when I saw those videos, you, I personally started to think about, you know, Brand Boulevard and it just kind of Austin, Texas, that kind of looked uh, a little bit like what we face uh, on Brand. Um, but my, my feeling is... Um, Definitely, uh, you know, there needs to be a safe route for bicyclists on that major artery that goes up up uh, Glendale North. Um, I would like to see, rather than something like this implemented, because the levels of um, the, the pieces of the puzzle that need to make this work 
are so numerous and so complex. Everything from re-educating uh, drivers uh, all the way to the financial and the expense that might be involved with the city. Um, I envision uh, for Glendale, uh, once we get, and it is in the distance, but near future because people are talking about it more, once we get Measure M money, and once we start focusing on a trolley that's going up, and I believe it's maybe central or brand, I don't know which one uh, was talked about, that would to me seem an ideal place um, to work in a safe place for bicyclists to traverse the streets without having to worry about cars and having to re-educate. Um, we're trying to get drivers to get off their phones, for goodness sakes. And as simple as a concept, that is, I can only imagine uh, the learning curve involved with getting them, um, especially the elderly population, especially those who don't have the technology in their cards to assist them with the backing up. Um, it seems uh, quite overwhelming. But I envision for bicyclists to have a safer even in something safer than, than just relaining or relining the parking. Right. That's right. Uh, I'm Chairperson Kirchin, um, Commissioner Yacobi, and our Brand Boulevard actually is a is very challenging, number one. And then also South Brand, Mid Brand, and North Brand are totally different animals. So it would not be one solution. I can, I actually, I have some feeling about uh, um, where the bicycle lane should go uh, at different sections. Um, of brand, but um, yes, the reverse angle parking definitely is not suitable for every location. Basically, I think it will be a it will really a big challenge to be trying to implement that on mid brand, especially when traffic is so congested, it's so difficult to find a parking space that might not work. But there are other locations that we can um, actually try out this this um, design there. And again, as, as they say, you, you have to try it out to see whether it will work or not um, in some locations. And what, what would be your thoughts on the res residential? It, I think right. you had given an example of the... Yes, res um, most of our residential streets are one lane in each direction, so they may be challenging to, get the f uh, uh, to fit the angle parking in. Um, but there are some other streets that we have um, in a city that may be, and even maybe Brand Boulevard, a certain section of Brand Boulevard, maybe we can try to reverse and go park it. They say, um, though, um, you get the best support for uh, reverse and go parking when you convert parallel parking to reverse angle parking. You get support from the business people because, and, and also the residents because you're giving them more on street parking. But if you already have um, angle parking and try to flip the, the, the angle, um, that, would be, that would be more challenging in, in, to get the public support. So I, um, if I, may, I also uh, appreciate the presentation and the information. It's very helpful and educational. Am I assuming then that currently there is no bicycle lane on the streets because of the angle parking? Um, actually, there are bicycle lanes on the no, street right now. Not share lane, but I mean an actual bike lane. You mean we, on streets that have angled parking? Yeah, right. Right. There is, is no. Brand Boulevard. I'm, Brand, I assume, would have bike lanes if we could with Correct. the parking configuration because the space is there. The current parking. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, first of all, Alec, thank you for suggesting this for this report and to enlighten everyone in the Glendale about reverse parking. In terms of implementing such feature, I don't know if people of Glendale or people of Los Angeles are ready for this yet. I think uh, something like this should be more streamlined, should be more common for people to be educated in order to avoid accidents. And uh, Brand Boulevard, having bike lanes on Brand Boulevard, if this Reverse angle parking is the only is the only mode for us to have bike lanes. Um, that might be a very isolated incident on Brand Boulevard. I'd rather see this be more generalized, be more streamlined, before we really think about this. Besides Brand Boulevard, Glen Oaks and Brand North of North of uh, Glen Oaks, we, there's not much location that we can implement this. Is there, uh, Mr. Cole? That is correct. Yes, because of street width. Yes, with a street width, and um, on Glen Oaks or even Brown Boulevard taking another lane out, I think it's prohibitive, isn't it? It depends on the location. It depends on the location, yes. 
Um, some, some streets are actually wider than is needed, the number of lanes. So that's why they were thinking about some option is about reducing the number of travel lanes. Uh, would actually some, in some situation actually will calm down traffic, but definitely not for streets that designed to carry traffic. And I was going through my notes right now. We have a lot of out of Glendale visitors to Glendale, especially with Americana and with their, with their employment situation. And when, I forgot how many percent of the drivers in Glendale are from out of town, that Alan Loomis brought it up a couple of meetings ago. There are a lot of transients through the city. If, are all those people gonna be using reverse parking lane? Are they gonna be educated enough to use uh, reverse parking lane? I don't know. It's, I mean, the closest city where, from what I, when you put up the chart was Ventura, Ventura City, Ventura, or Ventura County. Nothing closer to that than Los Angeles. Um, it's a good idea, but are we ready yet? I don't know. I don't think so. That is why, in order, if, even if we're going to implement it, we need to have a very really extensive outreach and education yeah. program. And unless those visitors are from the state of Washington, then they will feel right at home. Otherwise, <laughs> they would be, yeah, that would be a problem. So, um, but it was, it, it's very educational, though. This, this whole thing is, is very interesting. Now, we've got to, when we drive around, we've got to drive around with different, wearing different hats. <laughs> uh, may I? Yeah. Uh, what if you do a couple of pilot projects on residential streets to get the word out and advertise it. I know I can think of at least two streets that are wide enough. Campbell between Stalker and uh, Dryden is one street, and, and demand on that street is, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can never find a place. I, I visit some friends there. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that street has to be probably 56 feet, I'm going to guess. Uh, so. Uh, uh, the, the, the residents are, are, are going to definitely go for it because it's a constant battle for finding space. Uh, so, so once implemented, you can show the benefit of it uh, and advertise it through, through media, through television, and, and educate uh, and, and slowly maybe uh, uh, move to uh, the business district. But again, my, my preference uh, is, is protected bike lanes. The whole world is going towards that. Uh, uh, either way, uh, uh, you know, when, when you're driving reverse parking or, 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 or you know, head-in parking, uh, it's, it's not really improving the safety of bicyclists, bicyclists uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way I'd like to see it improved. All right, it's, it's, it's not substantial, let's say. You know, there's still a risk there. So it's, it's something that I would, you know, propose to the department uh, if they can take a look at some of the wide streets in the city. I think it's a win-win situation uh, and, and, and see what we can do. I, I want to agree with the commissioner. And I, again, the reason I brought this up is because North Brand, north of Glen Oaks, is proposed for bike lanes. So, if it's not this configuration and we're not uh, in favor of that, we need to figure out something. Um, and I am in strong support of protected bike lanes. I think that um, you know, maybe in this city we are not the trendsetters and we're not the first to do things, um, but I don't want us to be the last. And I'm glad that we have uh, grant money to do a cycle track on Los Feliz. I think that's a great project. Um, I would like to see protected bike lanes on North Brand. The, the volume on that street is so low, and the street is so wide that it's unbelievable. I'm surprised that people don't use it as a drag, you know, drag strip, and maybe sometimes they do. But, um, you know, we, people look to Glendale as the transit black hole in the metro system. And that's why, you know, nowadays we're talking a lot about light rail and uh, the trolley and ways we can get Glendale on the map. I think we can do that with bicycle infrastructure, too. There's so many things that we can be doing, and our bike uh, plan is a little outdated. Nowadays, everybody's looking into protected bike lanes. So I'm hoping we won't have to have this conversation and we won't have to be discussing reverse angle parking and how we can squeeze in bike lanes. I'm hoping we can just shoot for the stars and get those protected bike lanes in. So maybe this is a moot point. Um, I hope it will be and we can just get in the, the protected bike lanes. Um, go ahead. 
so I appreciate the comments that have just been made by the commissioners. Um, and I know this is an information item only. It sounds to me that, based on even what Morrow said about Morrow said about it, more of a comprehensive solution is really needed to look at these systems um, only isolated. It doesn't really get us an answer, I don't believe. It may get us a temporary answer, but it won't get us the best answer. And um, if there's other, are there other plans for brand that do involve uh, the, the trolley as mentioned, uh, why don't we proceed on a master plan to accomplish all of the objectives or guiding principles for better transportation, including protective bike lanes, including better walkable areas, and um, as opposed to just, say, looking at one specific item. I think we need a comprehensive design criteria and guiding principles on what to, what to look for. And if protected bike lanes is one of them, then that should be a guiding principle. And, and we should make decisions regarding that. And I know I heard one commissioner mention when Prop M money is available, we don't even know if the Prop M money is going to be available for us. So I think we're going to be very reactive as opposed to proactive which is a continual critique of mine that I wish we could be more proactive. Mr. Koh, uh, I read in the paper last week, I mean, that's, was, that's where I got my information from, about this trolley and it's coming down Glen Oaks and Brand Boulevard. Is that going to be where the old rail used to be, where the meetings are on Glen Oaks and Brand Boulevard? Um, Chairperson uh, Kretchen, um, I'm not familiar with that, that issue, actually. I, read, I, I got a copy of a news press article over here with me, and, uh, and it's got a map of starting from Glen Oaks and where, from Burbank and Woodbury all the way to uh, Larizarian uh, Station. Is that where median is going to be, uh, this article about? Um, yeah, I think I think community development is probably working on that part right now. The traffic engineering section itself is is, um, is not currently working on that project right now. Because the reason I was saying, if this is the medians, bike lane could be a perfect yeah. fit for next to uh, uh, next to rail. It'd be something very similar to Chandler, which is in Burbank, where you can have big uh, center medians. People walk. Uh, where, I mean, the trolleys can go over there, it'll be perfect fit and will serve all purposes. Right, and then most likely we'll probably need to have some type of protective signal faces for the bicycle to turn to actually, if, you, you if they're in the median there. I'll let you read it. Oh, same thing? Is it the same article? There's same a map article. here too. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a map. I have copies for all commissioners okay. and staff. <laughs> but I wish, us, if there's something like this, I wish we get emails rather than reading yes. in a newspaper. Okay. The on the second page. Oh, good evening. My name is Dennis Ambayak. I'm substituting for Rubik. Um, so yes. Um, so in the future, once we uh, we take a look at once we see this in the newspaper, and if it relates to transportation or parking, we'll we'll have um, public work staff send uh, uh, the commission um, an email. We happen not to read the uh, newspaper. We're not going to be out of news. Um, I'd like to discuss this topic uh, under comments later. If that's okay, fine. that's fine. Yeah, I support your comments. Okay. Anyone else? Any comments? Just thank, um, thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Well, yeah, thank you. Wayne. Well, I can yes make a comment. I just read the first paragraph. The SCAG uh, award is 4.5 million dollars, which will probably not even build one block. So, this is for study. study. For the study, study. yeah. This is I think. We can take a the study. We should get that money. <laughs> well, uh, but no, I mean, I want us to be realistic. The, the, these these are good projects, obviously, but I think what Alec is looking for is some some solution in a, in the immediate future and not 15, 20 years down the line. Right. So. I huh? agree with the with the holistic approach, and you look at the MyFig project that's coming on in downtown LA on Figueroa Street. Uh, uh, we'd rather spend the money uh, uh, right at the beginning and design it right versus you know uh, keep going back and forth and fixing projects that 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 we built. Uh, but we need a solution immediately, and I think that's why you introduced it. Absolutely, and. Since we're on that on that point, when is North Brand scheduled to be repaved? 
Do you have an estimate? Uh, we don't have it in our in the current three-year plan at this time. Oh, so at least three years from now? That's that's correct. Okay. So w whenever that is, that's we'll need to have addressed this issue by then because that's when we'll have to gonna, tackle oh, this. Sorry, I want to just jump in and um, first uh, kudos to Commissioner Bartrasoff again because you know your voice in and I have the pleasure of serving with um, the commissioner on the pedestrian safety advisory committee where uh, we're doing really some really uh, amazing stuff and it's always great to have um, his um, his knowledge and passion uh, definitely when we're discussing uh, all of this um, and and we touched on it here about trying to get to that bigger picture and I think the fear I would assume as a bicyclist, when you take that step back and say, let's look at it as a whole, the first thing that would go through my mind is, wow, that's really close to almost not looking at it at all. And so you, I know the, the feeling of wanting to put the city, the city's feet to the fire. And I, I, I appreciate that passion. I think that, you know, there's something admirable about that. My, um, my vantage point, in my opinion, is there seems to be a greater systemic issue in the city of Glendale, specifically with educating drivers. And my hope would be through the efforts that the city has undertaken with the B Street Smart Glendale campaign, and all of the uh, effort and initiative in educating and actually re-educating the public, that then doing something like this in the near future would be easier and um, you know, uh, more feasible to do in terms of having people change their behavior once we set you know, the tone and, and educate them on, on what their rights and what their responsibilities are on the street. So my, my thing is we can put our energy and passion and resources and money um, instead of doing a pilot right now, which is, you know, is, is I would think would be a good idea in the near future, but is to, is, to, is to continue to, to infuse the public with the importance of education um, and changing behavior. It's something that's got to change before we ask them to, uh, you know, back up and try new things, is to get them to understand the basics, which is respect for other people, respect for bicyclists, pedestrians, other drivers. And once I think we get that, then it might be easier for us to implement pilots and other things but th to me that's it's like a triage we have a city that has a, a problem right now with with safety and so what do we address first and so I think the first is is to stop the you know the terrible bleeding that's happening um, with that so that's just my two cents on that well anyone else I would still like to see angle parking on some of the residential streets mm -hmm. uh, I've never thought of it and I think uh, some of the streets could benefit from it, independent from this, so. Yes, um, actually, um, Commissioner Sahaki, and they actually, they recommend, um, if you want to start something uh, like reverse angle parking, start small first, yeah. before you go to the BC street and stuff like that, so that, yeah, that is probably an option we can okay. explore. Well, that's what I meant earlier by streamlining, if rather than hodgepodging or patching this block or that block, like Commissioner Yakubian said, it's, we'd rather get something uh, full on and get, once people are educated, it'd be easier for us to implement it and we, once people are educated and get used, are used to the idea, there are less room for error and less room for accidents, less room for everything else. Um, and I don't, I mean, as proactive as we want to be, uh, Commissioner Bartoshoff, but I think in a case like this, in a city like Glendale where people are not always so caring about driving and parking, I, I'd rather see this kind of be a follower on this and once people are more used to it. In a place like he said, Campbell or Royal, even Royal might not be a bad idea for, uh, for what Commissioner Saki is suggesting and uh, as a pilot. But other than that, I don't know. For Brand Boulevard, we're gonna have a lot of transients and uh, I don't think we're ready yet. With that, um, let's go to item number B, 5B. 5B is anti-bicycle harassment, an oral report presented by Mia Yen. Good evening, um, Chairperson Kirchin, members of the commission. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, 
City Attorney's Office was asked to review uh, certain bicyclist harassment um, ordinances that have been adopted by various cities in California, including Los Angeles, Berkeley, Sunnyvale, and um, a few other uh, cities as well. I think Davis um, has one, and whether um, the city of Glendale should have one. I sent um, a very detailed legal memorandum to each of you, and so right now I'll just um, touch upon some of those topics. Um, but otherwise, if you have any questions, you can ask um, them of me. City of Los Angeles adopted um, their ordinance in 2011. Uh, Sunnyvale and Berkeley adopted an ordinance soon thereafter in 2012. They are virtually identical. And what the ordinances do is create a private civil cause of action um, for bicyclists who have been harassed or alleged to have been harassed by any one of the following prohibitive acts. And one is either being physically assaulted um, as a bicyclist, um, threatened uh, with physical injury, threatened with injury by words or having objects thrown at them, and also being intentionally distracted um, as a bicyclist, and also if you are um, intentionally forced off your bicycle. So these suits can be brought by bicyclists who've experienced this type of behavior, and it can be brought against a driver. It can be brought against um, someone who isn't operating a vehicle as well. It could be brought against a pedestrian. Um, and under the ordinance, a, bicycle, a bicyclist may recover damages um, at a minimum of $1,000. And there can also be attorney's fees and punitive damages that are rewarded by a court. Um, one of the primary issues of this ordinance is the issue of preemption. Um, the preliminary question is whether these ordinances are preempted by existing state law. And while a city may enact and enforce its own ordinances and regulations that are of municipal and statewide concern, Local regulations that are of statewide concern are invalid if they conflict with existing state law. Put another way, the local regulations we would be preempted by state law. And a conflict arises when the local regulation either duplicates, contradicts, or enters into an area fully occupied by state law. Now, there's three areas of state law where preemption issues may arise here. The one is the vehicle code. Um, under vehicle code 21, no local authority shall enforce or enact any ordinance on matters that are covered by the vehicle code. And section um, 231 of the vehicle code extends its regulatory reach over bicyclists and bicycles. So some matters that are covered by the um, vehicle code that would pertain to bicyclists um, and may be pre um, preempted are um, vehicle code section 21760, where if a vehicle attempts to overtake or pass a bicyclist, that is a violation. Um, vehicles driving recklessly around bicyclists or just re driving recklessly in general, that would be a violation. Um, anyone throwing a foreign object at a bicyclist would be covered under Vehicle Code Section 23110. Another area where um, a local ordinance may be preempted is criminally and under the Penal Code. And I believe Sergeant Bracken uh, touched upon some of those uh, matters when he was before the Commission several months ago. Um, for instance, certain actions that are prescribed under these local ordinances would be criminal acts under the Penal Code. Um, for instance, Penal Code 240, Assault and Battery, um, that would cover anyone throwing an object at a bicyclist, um, attempting to hit the bicyclist, or um, you know, threats of um, physical injury, for instance, would also be a criminal code violation. The penal code section would be 422, criminal threats. Um, and so those are certain areas where criminal law already prescribes some of the conduct in these local ordinances. A final area is the area it's, of... Actually, these are state code, right? These are all these state are, law. These are all state law codes. Okay. 
Um, and the final area where a local ordinance may be preempted is in the area of personal injury or tort law. Uh, in addition to assault and battery in criminal court, anyone in a civil court can bring an action for assault and battery um, for any of the acts that were prescribed in a local, in, um, a local anti-harassment ordinance. And they could recover damages for physical injury, um, pain and suffering, emotional distress, and in some cases, if the defendant's conduct was malicious or reckless, they could recover punitive damages. So in conclusion, while the cities have a interest in providing safety for its bicyclists, whether a court would uphold such an ordinance um, in this area is uncertain and hasn't been tested. Um, and so I have actually inquired into whether these ordinances have been challenged in the three cities that I've mentioned, and they haven't been challenged but they also have not been utilized um, as far as uh, they know. Um, if you have any questions, that's all I have. Oh, actually, I wanted to provide an update, and, and maybe this is an example of um, where the penal code would preempt a local ordinance is um, the incident at Chevy Chase. Um, I don't know if you're all aware that that uh, case has been dispositioned, and. I believe this case was set to go to trial this, Jan this past January, and the defendant did plead to one count of assault with a deadly weapon as a, as a misdemeanor, and is doing performing ordered to perform 50 hours of community service and a fine of approximately $300 plus penalties, which, with court fees and everything, it turns out to approximately $1,100. So the state law was in place, and that's what did it. It, it was in. It's in our city of Glendale. Yes, state law would be applicable. In that you. case, they were using state law for that. Yes. That debate or that argument. Yes, the district uh, district attorney filed uh, charges in that case. I believe there were two counts of mis uh, misdemeanor assault filed, and the defendant pled on one count. So, so why in 2011, both of the two of the cities here went ahead and did a local harassment. Was the state um, one that you mentioned in effect at the time? It was in effect, and it has been in effect. <laughs> Anybody? Um, so the, I'm glad you brought up the Chevy Chase example because that's the whole reason why I brought this up as something to consider here in Glendale was just because of the behavior of that driver was just unconscionable. Um, you mentioned, and thank you for the memorandum, it's very detailed. Um, I appreciate all that information. The vehicle code um, examples that you mentioned, such as like throwing a foreign object at anybody for that matter, what are the consequences of, of that per state law? Uh, and what would the consequences be in, uh, with an ordinance like this in place? Uh, deter uh, based on, generally speaking, I mean, it's a case-by-case -case scenario of how egregious the violation is. Under the vehicle code, it could simply be a citation. Um, but um, the actions that are egregious as those of that driver on Chevy Chase, I mean, it resulted in criminal prosecution. Um, and it'll go on his record. Mm -hmm. um, under a local ordinance, the bicyclists in that matter could have, if they were in Los Angeles or Sunnyvale or Berkeley, they could have certainly brought an action under that ordinance. However, however, um, in Glendale, that it still would not preclude him from bringing a civil action. This, those bicyclists could still <clears throat> bring a civil action for assault and battery and obtain damages for uh, personal injury, uh, emotional distress, um, et cetera. So I, I would say the result would, could be the same. So in your opinion, the ordinance is more or less redundant with state laws? Yes, I think the area is, is covered by state law. Under the general principles of tort um, law, everyone we walk around, we're 
we have a duty not to injure people, <laughs> whether intentionally or negligently. And so if someone does that, you can certainly, you know, bring a suit against them in court. And uh, this, um, I think, you know, when I spoke to some members of the city, uh, respective city attorney's offices, you know, this, the purpose of the ordinance was a deterrent. And I think that education, um, that knowledge of these other statutes out there that are available to bicyclists um, would be would be good. Anyone else? I just maybe a come. question for Commissioner Alec. Would uh, do you feel that bicyclists are aware of that state ordinance or that state law? Because maybe there's a matter of the. Of letting people know that this exists because I know when I used to bicycle not as much as you do but a, an extreme amount actually people would get quite upset at, at bicyclists even if we were in a group mm -hmm. uh, and I was not aware that there was state ordinance that has just been described and I, I appreciate you bringing that to our attention because it seems like if we can just hang everything on that then we don't need a local one but we ought to make a point of letting people know it exists somehow Maybe it comes under the notion of another safety right. item. If exactly. bicyclists are aware that one has an opportunity to to make a complaint about someone that had potentially led to an injury because of the ordinance that, that the state has or the law that the state has, I think we wouldn't have to have a redundant one. Yeah, I mean that that's the thinking that I'm leaning towards. It seems just based on the memorandum and the information that's been provided today, it seems relatively redundant. Um, again, this was all brought up because of that incident on Chevy Chase, and thankfully it was recorded and there was evidence of, of what happened. Um, and I'm glad that that was addressed and the way it was addressed. So um, that alleviates my concerns, I think. Um, and thank you again for doing the research on it. I think, uh, sorry, just to touch upon that, you know, the, the importance of cameras as a bicyclist, um, I wear mine sometimes because it's really hard to prove intent or when something happens, the driver is often is gone and unless you record it. And the reason why they were able to um, capture this defendant was because the incident was recorded. Right. Even drivers are have forward-facing cameras now. You know, when you take an Uber or a Lyft, sometimes they have cameras facing the rear seats. You know, you never know what happens on the road. So cameras are being more and more utilized just, just for that reason. Um, thank you very much for the memorandum. I, uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed reading it. And um, yes, I definitely did see uh, and to use the commissioner's word, redundancy in, in some of it. But I did have a couple, a couple of, well, one, one question. Um, insofar as the idea that the municipal ordinance uh, doesn't um, overstep um, and conflict with state law, um, I wanted to ask you in your opinion about in terms of the remedies. So we have uh, the state law which allows for punitive damages. Um, but then we have a municipal ordinance not necessarily stating punitive damages, but allowing for trouble damages. So um, is that the municipal ordinance's way of um, kind of using that as a, a way to receive punitive damages? I believe that the uh, local municipal ordinances, they say trouble damages um, as a minimum. So they do set that minimum threshold um, if the defendant is found liable, but they also have a provision um, that allows for attorney's fees and punitive damages should those be warranted. Okay. And then the other, well, you know, this was a great memorandum because um, I, I truly feel this is, in my opinion, not an issue for a municipality. I do agree with your uh, conclusion and your analysis. Uh, and this should be an issue, though, to, to further my thought, an issue of county or state. So I think they should be taking the charge on this issue for sure, for the main reason of um, uniformity. So you have a bicyclist who's begun his ride in Glendale, 
and is being harassed as he passes into Los Angeles. So the chain of events will start to get a little fuzzy, and the idea of you know where and when and what what rules will apply to me that will create um, confusion. So I I. I do appreciate the message that this would be sending out. I just feel that there should be more, um, you know, clear guidance, and this should, you know, be from the legislatures, uh, you know, to, to come up with stronger, stronger laws and make it uniform throughout throughout the state. That's definitely something I I, I do support. Um, you know, the other issue that's involved with this on the side, if we were to adopt this, would be the issue of financial burden. Um, so then you would have people driving their cars, you know, would they then have to incur, and I'm talking about a nice person driving their car, someone who doesn't want to hurt anybody on a bicycle, well then, will they start incurring greater financial cost uh, with their insurance? Uh, will it affect their homeowner's insurance? Um, how will this affect uh, residents who are living in Glendale in, in that way? So um, I truly appreciated the memorandum. I love uh, the fact, uh, again, uh, Commissioner Bartrasoff, you brought this up, and I would love to see um, more uniform uh, laws being put out through the county and the state. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Your memorandum was, I read it twice, it was very detailed and uh, was very much to the point. And I think your conclusion, and let me, I'd like to echo what Commissioner Yakupian said. Uh, I'd like to echo whatever she said and your conclusion as well. Um, because bike laws is like a driving law, should be uniform across the state, and whether you use bike as a transportation mode, just like a driver, car driver is, should be, once, should be uniform across the state. If it's hodgepodge to through different states, enforcement, people get confused in what cities they are. Uh, cities like Berkeley or Sunnyvale or, or Davis, uh, they're university towns. Bike are mode of transportation in those cities. Maybe it is warranted over there. There are more bike riders than, than car drivers, but I don't think we need this in Glendale. And why Los Angeles created it, who knows? Maybe they're trying to create their downtown to be more residential friendly city, that's what they did, I don't know. But I don't think it's warranted this time. Uh, let, me, let me go a step further. Uh, don't you think it's important for us to get a headcount as far as how many bikes are in town before we even think of ordinances? I mean, do we have any idea how many bikes are out there in the city? Is there a database of that for that? There's a, actually through SCAG and UCLA, there's a bicycle clearinghouse um, that houses the bike counts that happen on a, sem, on a biannual basis. So there, there's bike count data for specific intersections. It's not comprehensive. There's no way to find out literally how many bicyclists are on the road, but there's trends that you can see in the data over time. Well, what I'd rather see done, uh, if this is, I mean, if this, this is, is this a forum to discuss that or not, is to create some kind of database, just like people who own dogs, they go to city clerk's office, pay, I think, $20, $30 and, uh, annually, and get a, a dog permit. We can get a bike permit for bike users and have a comprehensive data of who has what kind of bikes we have in the city. And before we even start legislating them. I mean, I don't know if that's something warranted or not at this time. Because, again, a good old friend, newspaper, news press, apparently women suffer significant injuries after she is struck by, by hit and run bicyclist. I mean, this is a shame. On Brand Boulevard, where there are all these cameras, this bike, uh, uh, this cyclist hit and run, and what kind of remedy does, does this person have? Do bikers require to have insurance since it's becoming a mode of transportation? Is, uh, bicycles are the ones who are becoming aggressors. As, this case, as more and more bicycles are out there, if, if whoever the aggressor, aggressor is, whether it's a, someone's behind the wheel or, or, or bicyclists or whatnot, should, be able, should assume liability. Uh, I don't know what the city's take on that is, and is this the right forum to discuss that? Did it such a good job that you convinced me within the first two minutes, so thank you. I don't have any comments. 
I mean, to your co to your comment, just as there's redundancies with state law, I mean, the same thing applies to bicyclists and drivers. I mean, we're, we don't seem to be up in arms whenever a driver kills a pedestrian here. We, you know, no, this, driver, this, driver happens, has this, this happens all the time, and I think it's misguided to be targeting, targeting a bicyclist. I think obviously what happened on brand is awful. Um, that intersection is very busy, and there's always pedestrians crossing. And I ride my bike on there, and whenever I get to that intersection, I just walk my bike across the street because I don't even want to be perceived as breaking the law. Um, but again, there's redundancies on rules of the road, and I think it applies to everybody, not just bicyclists, but pedestrians and drivers. And no matter what mode you're using, you're responsible ultimately for your actions. Yeah, I, uh, just to, well, I guess we're going to use this as the form of discussion, but, um, you know, there's, and you guys have kind of touched on this, um, uh, Commissioner uh, Chairman Kirkshen had, had touched on it. Um, you know, there's a, there's the issue of accountability, and if you ask me right now, anybody who's behind a wheel of a car, that could be turned into a lethal weapon. You know, we need to be putting much more attention uh, on those people, right, because that's what they're driving, potentially, is a lethal weapon. Um, what, what needs, I, I feel, what needs to be also understood from the, from, the, from the public's point of view as a whole, as they're looking at the situation, they also want to see um, accountability. Okay, so we're not talking about the blame game of any, but they want to see accountability. So when they see the city going through efforts of uh, building bike lanes and, and putting money into the infrastructure, which I think that they should, the question that we're kind of maybe not addressing is that it's a natural question is then, okay, then what is the responsibility of cyclists? And, and they do have a responsibility uh, on the roads. So the question then is, and this isn't to turn blame, and this isn't to say you guys need to be the ones that are careful, but there is that issue of responsibility, and you know, oftentimes people question why aren't, and I know there's a Massachusetts law that has this, and I don't remember, uh, uh, I had pulled it up, but you know, basically it requires bicyclists you know, to, and I don't know if we have this rule, but to, to be able to show their identification. If they have done something wrong in the city, if they're being pulled over, um, they should be subject to, let's say, a fine, or they should be subject to, if they're not stopping when they need to stop, then they should be getting a fine. And th that fund, that money, goes into a pot. And that pot then goes back into bicycle safety um, ventures. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily to punish, but it's to just get accountability and responsibility. So whenever we talk about um, things, I always want to always put in the measure. Because I think in the long run, uh, Alec, I think that we're, bicyclists and rights of bicyclists will go further when those issues are addressed up front. And I think that you'll have a greater base of people supporting you and supporting, not you, but like supporting bicyclists. And I support bicyclists, but the idea that we're going ahead and um, moving forward with um, a, lot of ex a lot of things, right? And we want them that, but we also say, hey, come to the table with us and let's see um, how, what you're going to do. And I know that this discussion maybe was brought up with the PD on one of the advisory committees that I had been on. And I know that they ne not necessarily weren't thrilled with the idea of, you know, the whole idea of administrative, you know, having a license plate or having, you know, ID on each bicycle uh, is, a, is a very daunting thing for, for the police to have to do at this point. But it's something to think about. And um, I'm all for it. I'm definitely all for it. I see bicyclists having the rights to the roads just as anybody else does. But I want you to succeed. I want bicycle. I'm speaking to you because you, you are the voice, right? So I, I want that to succeed. But, I, but in order for it to, to maintain and not have, I don't want to use the word backlash because it shouldn't be. More of public relations, more like, come on, we're in this together, is, is for people to see that we're all kind of moving forward together and accepting the rights and responsibilities. So that's my, my thought on that. Sorry for that long talk sometimes. No, don't, don't worry. Any other remarks? Any comments? OK, uh, number six. Item six is commission staff comments and updates. Any comments? Uh, there are no other comments from staff. So 
Oh, okay. Why don't I'll take this one, I guess, so if you're not sick already of listening to what I have to say. Um, so uh, Commissioner Bartrasoff and myself um, are two of the commissioners representing the TPC on the Pedestrian Safety Advisory Committee, uh, which um, I'll speak on behalf of both of us. We're very excited to be on um, because there's a lot happening in the city of Glendale, and every uh, meeting we have, um, there's more and more – and. Mr. Wayneco is, is of course part of the um, uh, this committee too as well, giving his input. Um, a lot of exciting things happening in the city of Glendale, uh, and the B Street Smart Glendale campaign. Uh, not maybe not everyone knows about it. We're working very hard. New exciting things are coming around. So I would tell any of the viewers watching tonight, uh, keep your eyes out. Uh, you're going to be seeing um, many uh, banners going up around the city. Um, you're going to start seeing the city's uh, investment um, in this really important cause to improve pedestrian safety, bicycling safety, uh, and in improve driving behavior. Uh, we are committed to this. Um, I do take uh, exception to what Commissioner Bartrasov said. I think, what was his words? We're not trendsetters in Glendale. I actually think we are. Um, I do in some ways. I jotted that down. I think we are trendsetters because we're constantly um, looking, uh, you know, it hasn't been discussed uh, out, but there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes to see what the city of Glendale can do um, with technology, um, with, with, you know, trying to be the first. We always like to try uh, a new thing. So, um, there will be some very exciting things coming forward, I, I'll, I'll say, um, that we're trying to do to improve. So um, we will keep you posted. Um, I think we're, they're making great progress, and things are moving at a, gr a, a fast pace, um, but everything is working out very well so far. Anyone else? Thank you for volunteering. I have comments. Go ahead. So um, I'm going to uh, piggyback on... Uh, our chair's uh, comment about the article in the newspaper, um, <clears throat> which I uh, handed copies out, and I appreciate that it, it's uh, not a lot of money relative to any kind of infrastructure, but it is a fairly decent amount of money relative to planning. But what I'm curious about is, uh, one, learning about it in the newspaper and not even knowing that we made such a either application or dialogue, <clears throat> and how this can actually be extended further when one looks at a map, uh, it indicates this proposed potential streetcar route. And I can see why this was depicted this way, because it ties in quite well with uh, other forms of uh, multimodal transportation, not only mentioning the Metrolink, but also the, uh, the airport. But is there any way that uh, a more comprehensive study could be done that ties into this study? Uh, by looking at taking this streetcar further north and up into the northern part of, of Glendale. Um, and I don't know whether staff is aware of this or not. Uh, there was a, a city planner, I believe, uh, that was quoted in the newspaper. But how, how can we make sure that this study is not limited to just going north a bit into the, I, I would say, the northern part of southern Glendale and then extending over to Burbank? And why would we not be studying this further into the northern part where more residents reside? But yeah, this is just the initial phases of the, the study. So we'll, we'll take a look at it and see if we can spill it over to uh, northern Glendale, maybe Burbank also. We'll take a look at that. But I think, uh, as, as Wayne mentioned, um, 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 community development is the one taking the lead on this. So we'll touch base with uh, Alan Loomis and his group to, uh, to inform what your your request is. And, and, and again, commenting earlier on comprehensive studying, um, there, are, there are some other ones that we've learned about that are happening in the east and west direction on rolling stock, as I understand, getting into Pasadena and getting into Burbank. How does that relate to this? And, and, um, and, and then um, when you mention you'll look into it, when can we hear back on this, please? Can we get this on our next agenda? I, I kind of have sometimes a, as uh, polite as I want to be, a concern about getting information back, uh, not in any disrespect to any staff, that you guys are doing a lot of work, I'm sure, and there's a lot on your plate. But um, now we have a measure that has been successful. Where do we stand with that as a city 
relative to transportation and parking. I think it would be great to get some update on that and, and also this so-called uh, streetcar. Um, so after, um, after the meeting or tomorrow, in the next couple of days, we'll touch base with Alan Loomis's group uh, and we'll try to bring it to uh, the next um, TPC meeting. Um, we'll, we'll try to bring well, it to when, that. When is that meeting, the next, our next meeting? Two months from now. Two months, that's a long time, folks. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next meeting should be scheduled on April 24th. April 24th? Yes. I'm sorry, April 24th? 24th. Yes. When the uh, TPC merged, uh, when tra traffic and transportation merged with engineering and public works administration, it was decided that the TPC meetings would happen every other month. So that's why we go dark one month and then we follow up the next month. Well, the 24th is not a good day because of the uh, commemoration of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, so we could have a special meeting before meeting. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, we shouldn't postpone it by a month. It should be within the, with the same week, maybe a different day or the Monday prior. Yeah, it could definitely be April 17th. Okay. Um, or it could be a special meeting on a different day. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Alec? Um, I have a few items that I would like to bring up, and hopefully if I we get consensus, maybe it can come up in the next meeting. Um, one reminder that I want to let the commissioners know about is Ciclavia is coming to Glendale. Um, and not many people know about this right now. Um, the city and Ciclavia staff are working on it, but it is coming up on June 11th. So mark your calendar. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I strongly encourage that you show up and check it out. It's a beautiful celebration of being outdoors and being physically active and experiencing the streets of Glendale in ways that you have never seen or could ever imagine. Um, the route is more or less along Brand, uh, beginning at Duran and coming down uh, and heading into Atwater Village. Um, so it's a beautiful route. Um, it's going to have a lot of interesting um, spaces and different ways that you can engage with the street. So, it's, it's beautiful. Hundreds of thousands of people often come to these events, and I'm hoping the same kind of success will happen in Glendale. So I just wanted to let you guys know about that. Um, a couple of things that I've been interest, interested in recently, um, one has been the employee rideshare program. Um, so as an employee, employer, the city of Glendale has thousands of employees, and these employees generate a lot of uh, trips. And a lot of times these employers have encouragement programs to carpool, to uh, maybe ride share, to bike, to walk, uh, figure out ways for them to get to work to uh, reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled. Um, and that's, I think, in today's age, very relevant and something that's very critical in, in the direction that the city's going. We're growing as a city. Lots of more residents are coming in. Um, I think one of our main priorities should be to address traffic congestion. Um, so I'd like to, I've initiated conversations with the, with the staff person who manages that program. Um, I've asked for some aggregate data on, you know, summarizing where employees live and how maybe, like, maybe they conduct, the city conducts surveys in determining who carpools, who walks, who bikes. Um, it'd be interesting information for us to know, and I hope the city already knows it. If they don't know it, they should know it. Um, I'd like to look at that and see if there's ways that this commission can come up with new ideas to encourage employees to not drive their car on their own um, to reduce congestion. I saw something recently um, with another city that was even encouraging uh, employees to use rideshare like Uber, uh, Uber Pool or Lyft Line to encourage multiple employees to use the same ride to get to work. Um, and I know we have various opinions on um, ride sharing, 
Um, but that was just one example that I saw recently that I thought was a new innovative technique. Um, and I just want to make sure that our program is up to date and is something that we're constantly revisiting and um, figuring out new ways to encourage people to get to work. Um, the other two items that I'm really interested in are, um, I know that as a city we have development impact fees um, for, new for new construction. We don't have development impact fees? Um, yes, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner Bouchersoff, no, currently we do not have traffic impact fee. I'm talking about traffic impact fee, no. no. development impact fees. Um, there are some fees for parks, I might understand. My understanding Quimby, is. Quimby fees? Yes, but not specifically associated with traffic. Correct. So the city has development impact fees that are not associated with transportation. I know some cities that have impact fees that are specific to transportation. Um, and this leads to a larger question, larger question of, well, where do these development impact fees go? I think it's something like sixteen or twelve thousand dollars per unit that's built in the city. I think is a fee. I, I think what you're what Commissioner Barshaw is referring to is the in lieu fee mm -hmm. that developers pay, and I think that goes to a pool of fund in the city to be used for parking structures or some kind of a uh, infrastructure. Uh, that's going to be used within the city. I believe that's what those in lieu fees are for. Uh, is that what you're referring to? Uh, I, I don't think it goes to garages. Um, I think it, 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 I don't know. I don't know that it does. I don't know where the money goes. And I think what, I, yes, what I'm saying is I'd like to know where those development impact fees, what they're used for. Um, and whether or not it's appropriate to have a specific transportation impact fee. Um, I know that the city of Santa Monica established one in 2013 that's specific to transportation. And, you know, Commissioner Yakubin and I were talking about where is all this money going to come from to uh, bring in these improvements for pedestrian safety. And the Santa Monica impact fee specifically goes towards new sidewalks, crosswalks, traffic signal upgrades, transit, bike facilities. You know, these things are the kinds of things that we would like to see in Glendale. And if we need a specific uh, funding stream to support that, then this might be something that we should consider. But I don't think that we can come up with a recommendation without knowing where the development impact fees go. Um, so I would just like to formally request that something comes back to us about development impact fees and whether or not we should be considering transportation impact fees. Actually, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Basusov, um, about mm, probably about f 10, to f 10 to 12 years ago, actually, the city actually did a study, conduct a study about um, traffic impact fee, specifically about traffic impact fee. And uh, we had a consultant doing it, basically, um, studies and compare with other cities. And uh, at the time, was um, my understanding is was not adopted by the city council. Um, things have changed. We have development now. So, um, yeah, at the direction of, of the commissioner, we will probably look at this issue again. Great. But right now, my understanding is there's no traffic impact fee for sure. Um, I, I my, understanding, that, my understanding is, is that the fees are probably going to parks right. right now. I know there's Quimby fees that are specific for parks. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that those fees uh, that are collected from the developers also go to other things. So. It'd be great to know what those are. Um, the other thing along the same lines is transportation demand management. So a lot of cities have this in place. And I think Go Glendale kind of serves as a, as a program in place of what the city could do. Um, but same thing, of course, city of Santa Monica. Um, this is also encouragement programs for employers or uh, developments to figure out ways to reduce traffic, um, vehicle miles traveled, uh, that come from that specific lot. So for example, um, Santa Monica requires uh, employers that have tw 10 to 29 employees complete a worksite transportation plan. Employers with 30 or more employees complete an, an emission reduction plan. So there's things that kick into place when you have a certain number of employees. And this seems completely relevant now that the Nestle building is being vacated 
and a new employer may, coming, may be coming in with 900 employees, we want to figure out ways to discourage them from driving on their own. So these are the kind of programs I'm thinking of. You know, as a commission, we're sitting here thinking of ways to address transportation issues. Um, and I think the first step in doing that is educating ourselves about these various programs and seeing what the city is doing now and how we can improve upon that. Um, so those are the, the specific things I'd like to look at, our employee rideshare program, um, get more information about that and do some surveying and see how we can expand on that. Um, transportation impact fees and to a larger extent development impact fees um, and transportation demand management. I do have a question. Sorry, Mr. that's Chair. a lot to take. Well, uh, I want to uh, piggyback on, on, uh, on one thing and ask staff. So the thousands of the units that are being built on Cent Central Avenue are not contributing to any traffic mitigation? Um, unless they are significantly impacting uh, the intersections, then the specific improvements will be required. We will be required to mitigate that impact. But in well, terms I mean, of how many residential developments we have on Central, and Central is already over capacity, and we know all those intersections are probably already at level of service F, and probably most of these buildings run up by all kinds of uh, uh, code variances. Uh, I can only, I can list, a, 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 you know, a, a several impacts on traffic, uh, especially at the freeway on-ramp off-ramps. Uh, so uh, I know there was a traffic impact study, correct, for, correct. for these. So, but, but from the statement you made, uh, there is no money to mitigate any of that traffic, or was there any recommendations by staff as far as mitigation for each one of these buildings when they were built? There are recommendations in the traffic impact reports. Okay. Um, certain, certain improvements will require widening the street, adding a right turn lane, that type of stuff. Uh, but in terms of a traffic impact feed, no, we do not have that right now. I'm looking at an article that was written in 2014. The city increased development impact fees uh, to $18,000 per unit. Um, and this particular article specifically mentions libraries and parks, uh, but it doesn't specify any other improvements that the money goes towards. Was there affordable housing in there? No. I don't, I don't think so. Um, so again, it'd be, I think it'd be good to educate ourselves about where this money goes and if we want more of it. You know, there's a lot of criticism, warranted or not, with all this new development, um, and I think this is just another tool that we could possibly use um, in mitigating some concerns. But, uh, sorry, I'm, I know it's your turn now. Uh, uh, Commissioner, I wanted to just uh, ask you, I'm with you toe-to-toe, -to -toe. I mean, I'm definitely with you on this, um, you know, looking at the different sources of ways that we can, because this is a, a, you know, again, what we're planning in the future with Glendale is a, a lot of improvement, and you can't necessarily rely on grants uh, all the time. Uh, it's, a, it's helpful, but it um, needs to be something that we have a, a solid funding, if we're, if we're going to make this, like you said, like a priority. Um, but part of the Pedestrian Safety Advisory Committee, we're going, is probably, the staff is go, probably going to be, at some point, look at, Wayne, maybe you could tell me, as part of that um, analysis as we're going through the process of what will be then put forth again in front of our commission and the final report then to go to City Council, um, won't there be already included in that report? Um, you know, I'm just trying to say, instead of having the staff write us a report, at which point they're going to probably, um, and if you could answer that, that would be helpful. If, you, if you're going to be doing that same kind of work to put into that final package um, that's coming out of the, this pedestrian safety advisory uh, uh, meetings and, and the final report, you know, we don't want to duplicate efforts and make you do more, you know, reinventing the wheel with that. So what would be the best way of doing that for, you know, keeping in mind staff's valuable time? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, 
Commissioner Yukopian, my understanding is this um, pedestrian safety study will include a rough cost estimate for all the infrastructure improvements. Um, so at this at a certain point, I guess um, staff will be going to council basically to um, work out the budget to implementing this plan. So I guess my point is, should we putting, be putting this effort into perhaps expanding the scope of what a staff would be doing on that report that's going to later come back to us, as opposed to having you run through, um, I mean, the same questions the commissioner is giving you now are the same great questions, I think, when we go back to our advisory committee uh, that he'll be presenting there. Again, not to duplicate the efforts, would you suggest um, bringing this issue up for them uh, to encourage them to include, have staff include that, not just a cost uh, analysis on those particular projects, but a little bit more expanded view on how the city can uh, fund this for the future. And I think that was part of the purpose of that committee is to see once the um, advisors leave and the public relations people leave and all that, we're left, um, you know, in the spotlight and we have to figure out a way to do it. So I think that that's, wouldn't that be a, a better place to, and I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner, what do you think on that since you're on the committee with me? I mean, I don't, it's a good question, and I would just say that if the consultant is scoped to look into this work, ask the consultant to do it. But somebody should do it. If it's the consultant that's being paid to do the pedestrian plan or city staff, I think um, I've, I've read many plans and worked with many consultants. The way that I see the PED plan coming out is identifying all of the ways that we can address something and listing off some ways that it can be funded mm -hmm. um, in a very, you know, scratch the surface kind of way. You know, these are your opportunities, go and get them. Um, I think what I'm looking at is something a bit more comprehensive right. that's not specific to safety, mm -hmm. but more specific to reducing congestion. Um, so the consultant may find that it's not in their scope of work to look into this kind of Got funding it. mechanism. Um, okay. Fair it, enough. It's, I, don't, I don't have an answer, but yeah. I think regardless, it, it needs to happen, and it should be sooner than later. Okay. For, scratch what I said, Wayne. <laughs> yeah. I just thought that maybe we could see if we could consolidate our efforts, but you're right. If it's just targeted toward uh, the congestion... Um, well, in inevitably, the funds will improve safety for pedestrians. So I don't, maybe you could pitch that as your angle to have the consultant do the work and not have city staff well, do it. Well, city staff will do the work. I mean, they have, uh, consultants are not going to know details as well as our own city staff, so they're going to end up doing all the work right away. Right. And you're nodding your head, yeah. Actually, is to have any cost estimates that are meaningful. Yeah, right. the staff's input right. has, to be, has yeah. to be in there. Right. Yeah. You appreciate my question, though, Wayne. Yes. I, okay. <laughs> And I, I, and I just want to say, I hope it's obvious, but I'll say it anyway. I'm not just stirring up the pot just to have you do more work. I'm no, no, genuinely no. curious on this, and I think as a commission, you know, we come here and we've, we've been here for four years now, and I think we meet so infrequently, mm -hmm. and oftentimes we just scratch the surface on a lot of issues, and so... Today, I feel like we got through a lot of things and we went really in depth and really understood. Now we all know everything about reverse angle parking. <laughs> and now we can form an opinion. But oftentimes, we don't have enough information and we're brought on here and we're asked to give an opinion on something that we don't know much about. So I'd like to be proactive about these things and you know, maybe we can learn about them at the next meeting and then maybe a couple meetings from then we can have an official recommendation to city council. Um, but the four years we've been here, what have we officially recommended to city council? Like, I, I want to get into policies, and I feel like, you know, my time is short here. I'm not going to be here forever. I might not even be here two meetings from now um, because the person that appointed me is no longer here. So um, I like to get on these things because transportation is uh, really important to me, and I feel like we're here for a purpose, and I want to make sure that we have our eye on the ball. I totally support Commissioner's comments on all this notion. I'm in the same wavelength that he is in. So I think getting information about uh, potential developer uh, uh, costs regarding transportation 
would be important for us. And the other two items you mentioned also. Any other questions or remarks? I have a question. Do, are, am I understanding that we will not be meeting on the 24th because of the conflict, and we will likely be meeting on the 17th? Just for my calendar, yeah. please. Uh, does that sound about right? That's what she's. That's something that we could do definitely. Yeah. So uh, the 24th will be opened up. We'll be opened up. Yes. Okay, and we might meet on the 17th. I should yes. tentatively hold that. Yes. Thank you. Well. Uh, today's meeting has been very enlightening, certainly, thanks to Commissioner Bartosov. And, uh, and the presentation by our city attorney has been <coughs> phenomenal. The report was very much in-depth. Uh, one question, uh, Mr. Ko, uh, bike lanes, what's the minimum width of a bike lane? One way, even if it's two way, what is the minimum uh, width required for bike lanes? Uh, okay, um, Chairman Kirkjian, um, a bicycle lane, if it is next to a curb and gutter, the absolute minimum uh, width is five feet. Okay. If it is next to parking space, uh, absolute minimum is four, but usually we're trying to do five, at least. What about if it's two-way uh, parking lane? The, I'm talking about two-way bike lane. Bike, I mean bike lane, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I don't believe there's an, a specific dimension for two-way, but I would just expect a, a double that width, probably. Okay. Uh, the my question, because of the report, after I read the report, I think if we can have a two-way, five, or we can allocate five or six feet from bike lanes next to the proposed uh, trolley on Brandon Glen Oaks that's out there, which uh, the article we just passed around, I think that's very much warranted. That's something that we should, if we have the ability uh, on an uh, upcoming meetings, give a recommendation to, this, to the city council for them to, to really implicate that, uh, to have a dedicated bike lane next to uh, the trolleys. Um, yes, Chairperson Kirchin, yes. Um, actually, there's definitely a, a possibility of that. Um, usually when we have bicycle in the middle of the roadway, um, a, care, a special care has to be taken to make sure they are not in conflict with the turning vehicles. Um, so you see uh, other cities that implement bicycle lane, uh, especially two-way bicycle lane on the one side of the roadway. Um, they have usually have protected left turn, uh, the bicycle facing for that. So um, the challenge we have for Brand Boulevard is we try to put everything into Brand Boulevard. We put in angle parking, we put in pedestrian, we put in transit, we put in um, vehicle lanes, and also now if we pack in the, tra uh, the, the trolleys. Um, so it would, be, yeah, it would be a challenge to basically uh, how to handle all that conflicts. If you put the bike lane next to a trolley, you don't need the reverse angle. You can we use the same mode. That's what that is using. correct, yes. So, uh, except with exception, if the bicycle wants to make a right turn, so they would have to merge all the way to the to the curb to make that right turn. So that type of maneuver, we need to make sure we address that. Okay. Um, and also, I had inquired about IKEA traffic, which is uh, overflowing to Glendale. Do you have any report for us about that, Mr. Cole? Yes, actually, um, I've been in contact with the city of Burbank traffic engineer. And also, I was, I was actually there that Saturday after the grand opening. And uh, yes, congestion, there are, there are definitely congestions on San Fernando Road. Um, most of the congestions actually start probably about two blocks right at before city of Glendale's boundary, like around Elm or something like that, at uh, 3.30 to 4 o'clock in the, in the afternoon of a Saturday. And that was a, the first Saturday before the grand op uh, right after the grand opening. And I was based on the information provided by the city of Burbank. They had about 28,000 visitors on that day. And there were some challenges because they were closing, I guess, IKEA. Once their parking structure was full, they closed down the driveway totally. So that forced everybody to go to, I believe it's called Providence, Providencia, that street, and all the left turns are made there. And because of the limited length of the left-hand pocket, uh, it's block blocking the um, number one San Fernando Road lane, actually, the, the travel lane. 
So um, they have since made some improvements, and also um, the the number of visitors has uh, decreased significantly. Um, the, the next Friday, the next Saturday after the the grand opening weekend, uh, it drops down to 19,000. They're hoping that it will go down to 15,000, where the the normal um, weekend prediction uh, uh, they have. So uh, they are having, I saw them, they have uh, Burbank police there. Uh, they also have flaggers helping people turning in and out of the driveways. And so they are fully aware of the, the challenge they have and they are working uh, on it. Because they're also creating traffic on Flower Street. People are cutting, using flower to cut to Alameda. And that's traffic definitely in Glendale. Yes, that is, that is increasing the, the level of traffic on, on our city street. Um, I, in terms of, of congestion, I, I don't believe they are there yet, but we'll keep an eye on that. Okay. I mean, do we have any, I don't want to use the word leverage because they're a different city. Uh, what's the best way to deter traffic from Glendale? Actually, right now, we're, we're, I think the best way is just to working with City of Burbank right now. And they are very cooperative right now. They are, they are very straightforward. They tell us what their challenges are and, and uh, what they plan to do right now. Um, so we will continue to work with them. Um, I, they, they did a traffic, actually did a traffic impact study um, probably about two years ago. And uh, the study kind of identified two intersections that are significantly impacted, they are both in the city of Burbank. And which, when I, when I went out there and when I look at it, it's pretty, actually it's pretty accurate. Um, so right now they, are, they have already implemented the mitigation measures and they are trying to do the best they can. The reason I'm asking, I know people who used to exit at Alameda, now they're exiting Western and using Western and Glen Oaks and other means to avoid intersection of Alameda and uh, Saffron Road to get home. Yes, um, that is a possibility. We are actually, we can probably conduct some traffic counts and then to kind of compare with our uh, original database and see what, what kind of volume we're looking at right now. Um, I, when I was there that Saturday after the grand, uh, grand opening, um, I don't see any congestion on Western, but definitely on Alameda. And also all the side street coming down to San Fernando Road too, between Glen Oaks and San Fernando Road, because of the bumper to bumper traffic. And it took me about 25 minutes to make four blocks from the city boundary to pass uh, IKEA. Yeah, that was yeah. very busy. I tried to convince my wife it's a good idea just to drive, drop by, but I don't think she <laughs> liked it very much. So. Any other questions, any other remarks? Okay. And we have a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion. I'll second it. Oh. Nobody wants to meet. I'll second it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you April 17th. Thank you.